okay and we are live take a look it's in a book a reading rainbow <laughs> hey everybody it's Allie the canine nutritionist from Padfoot Palms Poodles and Pals so we are coming to you live on a Friday night <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I just barely survived this week. What about you, Indy? Here, hang on. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Say hi to everybody. Say hi to everybody. This is Indiana. Hi. Say hi to the people. Look. They're coming in. Look, Megan's here. Say hi to Megan. She said, Megan said, woohoo, party time. It is, we're having a poodle party. Right? A Friday night poodle party. <laughs> Here comes Sega. Okay. All right, off. Off. Good babies. Okay. Good job, guys. Hey, everybody's joining. Hello. Ariel's here. Hello. So, um, I've got... Quite a few topics listed out for us tonight. To turn, Okay, puppy. Yes, thank you. No bite. No bite. Puppy life. Um, I've got quite a few topics. People posted their questions that they had for me. But as always, if you have a question, um, anything dog related, please put it down in the comments for me. And I will be scrolling back through periodically. Hi, Judy. And I'll, um, I'll be sure to answer your questions as I go through. The comments kind of scroll in front of me, so I'll scroll back through so that we can see them. Okay. Hi, Kennedy. Okay, you guys go lay down. Or not. Get mad at each other. Go on. Lay. Shh. Hey, go lay. Go lay. Everybody just woke up from a nap. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how this goes. Shh. Hey. Uh-uh. Okay, you want to say hi to everybody? Here's Kennedy and Sega coming up the back. Everybody's irritable because they want me to pet them. Okay, all right, guys, go lay down. Okay, I'm so sorry. Let's get started. All right, so our first question had to do with uh, prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes. So let's just jump right into it. Um, because I know that a lot of people get tripped up on this, especially because in human product marketing, it's it, it can be super confusing. I'm just going to break it down for you very simply. So prebiotics, you're going to think of those as the food for the probiotics. So the probiotics are the actual live beneficial bacteria that sets up shop and has a party in your gut, or in our case, in your dog's gut. So, um, yeah, so the prebiotics are going to be feeding the probiotics. And then digestive enzymes are enzymes that are used to break down food. So you'll see that there are a lot of supplements that add digestive enzymes. They're usually uh, supplements that are specifically for digestive issues. Um, there are a whole list of issues that can benefit from digestive enzymes. So, should you be giving these to your dog? Well, that's a very good question. And what I would say to you first is, do you have a goal in mind when supplementing? Right? We don't want to just start adding a whole bunch of stuff to our dog's food. You always, always want to supplement with a purpose. So let's say that your dog it has a sensitive stomach and you're looking to build up their gut flora, right, to try to help them when they're um, being introduced to new foods, right, to overall make them healthier. So you could absolutely do a prebiotic and probiotic combo. Hi, Sega. Off. Good girl. Off. And um, depending on what kind of digestive issues they have or how much of a sensitive stomach they have, you could also add a digestive enzyme. Now, do you want to give this every day? 
for the rest of their life? No. Do you want to um, get one brand and one brand only and that's all you ever give them? No. Um, I don't recommend that for dogs and I don't recommend it for people either. So the idea behind probiotics is that you get a variety, right, of beneficial bacteria. Off, off, off. Sorry. Um, you get a variety of beneficial bacteria. Well, if you're just giving your dog the same probiotic over and over and over again, then they're only getting whatever's in that probiotic that you're giving, right? So you want to switch up your brands. You want to switch up, take a look and see. I just happen to have this on my desk um, because I'm currently switching probiotics. So um, you want to look and see when you're looking at the label, it will tell you how much, this is for humans, this is not for dogs. It just happens to be on my desk. Um, it will tell you how much of which kinds of bacteria strands are in the supplement, right? And that's going to make a big difference because what you'll find when you start reading the labels is that there are a lot of companies that have probiotics on the market that only have one strand of beneficial bacteria in them. And you could be... Yeah, Judy, I know you, you can't read it. It's backwards. I'm sorry. Um, I'm just using it as a as a reference. It'll it'll have a, a supplement facts on here. Guys, stop. It'll um it'll have the nutritional facts. Hang on. Hey. You guys stop. Hey, shh. Hey. You know, everybody always asks me, oh, your dogs are so well behaved. They're always so good when you're on camera. It's all out the window today. Hey, shh, Sega, stop. I have multiple females that are in heat. Shh, hey, uh -uh. And so they're grumpy with each other. Hey, shh, that's enough. Stop, or I'm gonna separate you. Sega, leave it. Shh, leave it. They're just getting on each other's nerves. So you want to take a look and see how many strands of beneficial bacteria are in your supplement, right? Because some of these supplements, you got to be careful. They can be $50, right? For 28 capsules. They can, I saw one earlier that, um, that somebody was recommending in another group and I went to go look it up. It was $126. And when I went to look and see how many different strands of beneficial bacteria, there was two. There was only two. Like, really, to get bang for your buck, there should be four, five, the more strands, the better. So, anyway, I was just using that as a, as a reference. I'll set it down now, because I know you can't read it. Okay, so... That gets us started. Let me scroll back up, make sure I didn't miss anybody's questions. Hey, Crystal's here. Hello. Okay, great. Okay, we will cross those off the list. Let's talk about ear infections. This is one that I see posted in the Facebook group a lot. And people are always asking me, what do I use? And, um, you know, how do I keep the ear infections from coming back? Yes, NuVet is one of the vitamins that I recommend. Um, it's a multivitamin or the new joint, which is the counterpart to the multivitamin that's specifically a joint supplement. But yes, I do recommend those. So... What can you do if your dog is prone to, hey, Crystal, <laughs> um, if your dog is prone to ear infections? Well, my first recommendation is if you can get them on fresh food, that would be the best that you could possibly do for them. 
fresh food, whether you're using one of the complete and balanced recipes that's in the group in the file section, or if you're ordering a pre-made fresh food from, um, you know, one of the companies from the recommended food list, whichever way you decide to go, um, it, it's going to be significantly lower in carbs and starches. And all of those carbs and starches are going to feed yeast. Right? Yeast and bacteria are going to be your two main culprits when it comes to ear infections. So, um, fresh food, always my first recommendation. If you can't do fresh food, then my second recommendation would be get them on a fish-based kibble. Hi. Do you need to go out? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Can you just hold it for a second? They were just out five minutes ago, I promise you. Hi, you're a good girl. So, fish. Why fish? Well, in most cases, pet parents are not using a fish-based food, which means that by moving your pet to something like fish, you're going to get them away from any potential protein uh, intolerance or sensitivity that they might be developing. That could be another reason why they get ear infections. Um, I've only ever had maybe two people that moving their dog to a fish-based food, it didn't help them. Um, otherwise, it is wildly successful. Um, I always recommend you pick one off of the recommended food list. If you can do a freeze-dried raw, that's fish based, that would be ideal because again, it's gonna be very low carb, um, very low starch. That's Indy, hang on. All right, come on guys, let's go. Out, let's go out. This is all that barking. Okay. We fixed that right up, didn't we, Velocity? You're a good girl. You're the only good dog. <laughs> She's so sweet. Come here. You want to say hi to everybody? Say hi. I'm a velociraptor. I love you. Can you go lay down? I love you. You're a good girl. Can you go lay down? Can you? Yeah, I think your mom's here. I think I heard her outside, which means everybody's going to start barking soon. Okay, off. Good girl. There you go. Okay. So, fish. Always a good option. Um, in addition to switching over to a fish-based food, you want to start an ear cleaning regimen. Now, any of you floppy ear dog owners, I'm talking to you, okay? Especially if you have poodles. Um, you want to make sure that you have a cleaning regimen. And what I do is we do once a week on Sunday, right before all the dogs are going to bed, right? So they're tired and we just clean everybody's ears, make sure they're nice and dry and put them to bed for the night. Um, some of the products that I really like are the Zymox products. They have an ear cleaner, they have wipes, they have um, uh, anti-itch drops that you can put into the ear if your dog is you know, getting over an ear infection. Um, one thing that I will say is do not be afraid to take your dog to the vet if they have an ear infection, right? We've all probably had an ear infection at some point. It's very painful. It makes the whole side of your head hurt. Like, just don't even mess with it. If you notice that your dog has a yeasty smell in their ear, just go ahead and take them to the vet. They can do a swab and then let you know if it's a bacterial infection or if it's a yeast infection so that you can properly treat it because it is a different treatment based on what the issue is. Um, but all of these tips that I'm giving you will work for either one. Hey, Brandy. Okay, so if you have a floppy ear dog, for example, a poodle or a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, and they have a lot of hair, 
I highly recommend that either you or your groomer shaves the under part of the ear. You don't have to shave the top part of the ear, right? In case you like their hair to be fluffy, that's perfectly fine, but have them shave the under part of the ear. Um, specifically with poodles, groomers will go in and do, um, they'll pluck the hairs out of the ear. That's really gonna be between you and the groomer. Um, it depends on the dog. For example, Velocity has very little hair that grows in her ears. So what I do is I just kind of keep an eye on it and I will trim it kind of in this lower area here if I find that it's getting very long. Whereas Kennedy grows like a forest coming out of the side of her head. And so we go ahead and we have her ears plucked when she goes to the groomer. Um, they have powders that they can use that will, you know, numb up the area so that it doesn't hurt. Um, after they do the plucking, it can be a little bit tender, so just be aware of that. Brandy said, I used to pluck my schnauzer's ears. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Megan said, even double-coated breeds, Goldens need the same. Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, the other reason why you want to shave that underside of the ear is because floppy ears hang down, right? And for the most part, they're not getting a lot of airflow in that area. So by shaving the underside of the ear, you're creating more space for there to be airflow. Because what happens is that the inner part of the ear can collect a lot of gunk, it can get wet, and when it stays wet, right, things have a tendency to grow. So you wanna keep it as dry as possible. Um, <clears throat> if your dog has an ear infection, after you get treatment from the vet, you're going to want to clean their ears at least once every three days. You can do it twice a week, set a reminder in your phone, um, and then once the ears are under control, then you can switch to once every two weeks. So what we do is if somebody gets starts to show symptoms of an ear infection, we just start cleaning everybody's ears and we can usually ward it off um, before it becomes a problem. And we live in a very hot and humid area, so it, it tends to pop up from time to time. Okay. So that's ear infections. Let me scroll back up. Crystal said, loving the new hair, by the way. Thank you. I had it like really hot red there for a while. Okay, I know I saw a question. Was it Judy? Judy, did you have a question? I know I saw it, hang on. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Where is your question? Okay, Judy said, can we talk about flea and tick prevention? Yes, we can. So um, I am a huge fan of Wonderside products. Um, they have sprays that are all natural. You can use them on puppies. You can use them on adult dogs. You can use them on yourself. Um, my poor lawn guy, <laughs> he... Um, he was like, I completely forgot my off spray. Do you have something? And I was like, I do, but it's not going to be a pesticide like off is. Here you go. <laughs> and he's a very tall, big, big man. And so he was spraying himself down and he was like, oh my goodness, I, I smell like a bouquet of flowers now. And all the bugs are going to want me. And I was like, no, 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 I promise you, it's lemongrass. They're not going to want you. And he was like, okay. He was very impressed. So um, I like it because it doesn't create like a greasy film on the dog, aside from not being a pesticide, which is, you know, never good. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that people always ask me is they want to know what I do for um, flea, tick, and heartworm. And we use Sentinel Plus. That's the one that Dr. Judy Morgan recommends if you're going to use um, an oral medication for heartworm. 
Um, and we do use that because, like I said, we're, we're in the bug zone. Um, if you live up north where maybe only a few months out of the year it gets warm enough to even have mosquitoes, then you can get away with something like, um, you know, doing Wonderside and then only using an oral medication once every 60 days. And if you're curious to know more about that, I actually have the latest study linked in the group. If you do a search for flea and tick, um, there was a study that they did that shows that you can use the flea tick heartworm pills um, once every 60 days. And then they did another one where it was once every 90 days and they found that it was just as effective as giving it every 30 days, which is very interesting. Um, speaking of that, I saw a commercial just the other day where they were saying, oh, you can use this, this new pill and you only have to give it every 60 days. And I was thinking, you know what? That is probably the exact same pill that they have always had and marketed and told people to give it every 30 days. So let's Sue's bringing the trash cans in. So yeah, so Judy, I hope that helps. Um, neem spray is another really good option. Doesn't really matter the brand. Um, that's another really good option that you can spray on your dog and yourself. Da, da, da. Wonderside, um, we use it during the, the hot times of year, which for us being in the South is all the time. Um, yeah, we, we use it every day, um, unless it just rained. And I will say that we just purchased, uh, this new mosquito contraption. It's like this big, huge thing. I'll have to get, hi, I know she's here. I know. Good girl. It's okay. She's trying to tell me she's here. Off. I know. I know she's going to come in. Anyway, I'm going to have to get a link for it because I've been testing it out and what it does is it um, it makes the mosquitoes in like a two acre area, makes it so they can't breed. It's very cool. And I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. So hang on just a second. All right, out you go. Mom's home, so they'll be excited. All right, let me scroll up here. We live in San Antonio and we have so much mosquitoes right now, it's crazy. Yeah, it, it's just getting to be that time of year. You just have to do the best that you can. Okay. All right, Horace says, in your opinion, is it cheaper to do DIY raw or pre-made? So DIY is always going to be cheaper because when you purchase your supplements, for example, if you're using one of the complete and balanced recipes from the files, once you purchase those supplements, they're going to last you a long time. Unless you're like me and you've, you know, got eight dogs that you're feeding, in which case, you know, you'll run out a little bit faster. But most people are not, are not in that predicament. So once you purchase your supplements, they will last you multiple, multiple, multiple batches of making that recipe. Also, when you're purchasing each individual ingredient, you can price it and be really frugal about where you get your meats, your organ meats, your bones, right? So it's something that's challenging right now because of the logistics of, you know, all the prices going up and inflammation and shipping and all of that is very challenging. I always tell people if you can find a butcher locally or um, any of the phenomenal ethnic markets, you can find a lot of really great meat and organs and bones that you can incorporate into your DIY recipe at a great price. Um, if you can afford to buy in bulk, that's also a way that you can save money. 
Um, it just depends on if you have the space to do it. If you've got, you know, a large freezer or an extra freezer, then absolutely you can buy in bulk and you can save, um, you can save a lot. So Judy says, is Brovecto bad? Yes. Yeah, I do not recommend it. Um, there are entire groups on Facebook dedicated to all of the pets that have either suffered severe side effects or been killed by that product and many others. So yeah, definitely, definitely take a look at those. I do not recommend Brevecto at all. I do not recommend any of the collars. I know that people like to be able to just put on one of those flea and tick collars. No, 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 don't do those either. I know you see them sitting on the counter at the vet and it looks like a good price, but it's just pesticides that are literally sitting on your dog's skin all the time. It's just, it's not good for them. And many dogs get all kinds of burns and everything like that. Maria said, you said Sentinel Plus for flea, tick, and heartworm. Yeah, so um, it's the Sentinel Spectrum that's the one that we use. Um, it, it's like a couple dollars cheaper than the Plus, but it does the same thing. But yeah, Sentinel is the brand. Okay. Ah, Michelle said, what about Wonderside's collar? Well, I have not used it and I have not looked at the ingredients. I do like Wonderside, so I can only assume that they are taking their products and putting it into a collar, um, but I I wouldn't say for sure without looking at it. Um, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of collars in general, whether it's for flea and tick or for identification. Um, our dogs do not wear collars unless. They are on a leash or in a harness. We're going somewhere. Um, I've seen quite a few dogs that have been just playing with another dog and then been injured, you know, by, by a collar. So I'm not a huge fan of collars in general for that reason. So I personally won't be trying out the Wonderside collar, but take a look at the ingredients and see what it is that they've got in there. And if you do decide that you want to try it, then try it on your dog for a day and then look at their neck. Go move the hair so it's all the way to the skin because even things like essential oils, right? Even things that are natural can still be abrasive, they can still cause a rash, they can still cause irritation, they can still cause the dog to itch. So just definitely give it a try and, and see, see if it works for your dog. Brandy said, one of my Danes got a horrible burn from those collars. Yeah, um, it's actually a lot more common than people think. Um, the reason why people don't know about it is because when vets um, report back to these companies what's happened, more often than not, it gets blamed on something else. Oh, the dog had an allergic reaction, but the owner also said that just, they just started a new food two weeks ago. Okay, well, the new food that they started two weeks ago is not going to cause a rash on their neck where they were using a collar for flea and tick that's, you know, got serious chemicals on it, right? And now they have a chemical burn. But it, you know, that's, that is how it works in the veterinary world, unfortunately. Okay. Michelle said, thank you. You're very welcome. Since, okay, Crystal said, since I live in San Antonio, mosquitoes are a problem here. Would you recommend me to use the Sentinel Spectrum? Yes. I'm looking on light right now. Is the Spectrum a chew? Yes, it is. Um, I think it also comes in a pill, but we get the chews. 
they're fine. Um, we use them once every 60 days based on that study that I was talking about that's linked in the group. So that's how often we give it. So I buy it as if I'm getting, giving it every 30 days, but it just lasts that much longer. Brandy said, as soon as I saw her neck, I immediately took the collar off of her. Yeah, I'm glad that you did because it, it'll just get worse and worse and worse. And the dogs that I feel sorry for are the people who just have outside dogs um, and they're not really paying attention to them and they just put a flea and tick collar on them and then those dogs end up having serious burns, serious chemical burns. Okay. Judy said, talk about raw meaty bones for palms. Okay. I have that marked on my list here because I saw where you had commented that question. Thank you for that. Okay, so let me make a note for myself here so I don't miss because I'm skipping questions now. Okay, so dental chews for Pomeranians or medium to small breeds. This would be a good option for them. So which meaty bones are the best? Um, basically, you're going to be looking at your smaller variety raw meaty bones. So necks, usually it's going to be a chicken neck. Um, wings are a good option. Again, these are raw bones. Please don't ever give cooked bones. Okay, so we've got necks, feet, ribs. And for ribs, you're going to be looking for like lamb ribs, right? And no, I'm not talking about the basted ribs that you see um, for sale in the pet section of the grocery store where they're all brown and they've, no, those are cooked bones. Don't ever give those. I'm talking about raw ribs. So next, feet, ribs, poultry frames. Those are also a good option. Um, wings, heads, which depends on if you can stomach it or not. Uh, scapulas, I'm seeing a lot more scapulas available in the store, which is great. Um, and those can be dried or raw. Most of the time I see them, they're dried, which is fine. Um, tendons are also a good option. And goat horns. Goat, goat horns are good because they're, they're kind of in between. They are a horn that will last a long time, but they're not so hard that they're gonna break your small dog's teeth. So, yeah. Okay, I'm just scrolling back up, make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, Samantha says, what if my dog refuses raw? Found her on the streets and she's very picky. All right. Well, um, I suggest that you sit her down in front of the TV and have her watch a lot of raw feeding videos so that she can become better educated. I'm just kidding. So some dogs don't like raw and that's perfectly fine. Um, in that case, you're going to want to stick with specifically when talking about bones, you're gonna wanna stick with the bones that are freeze dried um, or dried. And there are a lot of really great options out there. Um, Farmer Hound is a great website. They have lots of options for different chews, um, all of which are natural. And Oxtail, yes, Judy, Oxtail is a good one. Um, you just have to be careful about tails and feet because they have a tendency, if they're raw, they have a tendency to be fattier pieces. So especially for medium to small breeds, it might be too much fat. So just take a look at them, see how much fat is on them and, and make a judgment call from there. But yeah. Um, also, Samantha, there are some other options. If you take a look at the file section, there are a couple of documents about healthy bones and chews. I also have videos on my YouTube channel where I show all sorts of great options that you can get from various stores. 
um, TJ Maxx, Ross, Marshalls, Home Goods, PetSmart, Petco. I think Target just had the bully sticks and the ox horns. I don't think they really had anything else as far as healthy chews go. But um, definitely be sure to check out um, my YouTube channel because I have a lot of videos there. Every time I go shopping, I show you guys what I get um, and how much it cost. Okay. Brandy said, what are your thoughts on from? So I do not recommend any foods that contain legumes or potatoes. So the, the jury is still out on the effects that legumes and potatoes have on dogs. And until they complete the research, which is likely going to be a few years from now, um, I just don't recommend it. It's not, most pet parents are not doing rotation. They feed one thing for a very, very long time until their dog becomes sick of it or forever and they never change it. Um, and, and feeding that way can be problematic. So I don't recommend from. Plus there are some really great options on the recommendation list that are in a better price range with better ingredients than from. So definitely check that out if you're if you're looking to switch foods. Judy said, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Samantha said, thank you with a heart. Beep. You're welcome. Very cool. Okay, so before I forget, we did have another question that was posted from the Facebook group. So let me get that and then I'll jump back in to the comments here. Okay. So somebody had asked, how many different foods in a week can your dog eat? And she was specifically saying that she feeds two to three different brands. They're the same protein plus fruits and veggies. So how many can you feed? That's all going to depend on your dog. Um, ideally, you want to be able to feed multiple proteins in the same week. For example, you could do fish on Monday and pork on Tuesday, right? And turkey on Wednesday. Ideally, you want your dog to have that kind of stability in their microbiome, which goes back to what we were talking about earlier about probiotics and building up that microbiome, right? So do you have to do it that way? No. You don't. And it's not something that every dog will be able to do. I have a video on rotation where I go in depth talking about this, and I would highly recommend that you watch it. Um, but just for the brief overview part, can you feed them two to three different brands, same protein, fruits and veggies? Absolutely. Um, it'll be something that you need to work up to um, especially if you're just starting your dog out on something like this. And the more you do rotation, the more variety you provide them, the better they do, right? Because if you think about it, we don't eat the same thing every day unless you're like me and you get really excited about baked potatoes and decide that you really just want to eat baked potatoes for two days, which I did. Um for the most part, we're not eating the same thing every day, right? And your dog doesn't want to eat the same thing every day either. So um, you just want to build up, right? That microbiome, do it slowly, right? Don't give your dog diarrhea. Don't get crazy with it. Don't be like, hey, we're going to have a different meal. Every meal time, your dog is going to be, whoa, my butt's exploding everywhere. Don't do that to him. But give them a little bit of variety, right? Give them a chance to work up, right? So that they can get to a place where they can have multiple brands in a week or multiple proteins in a week. You could switch up your fruits and veggies or meats and organs based on what's on sale, which is a phenomenal reason to invest the time and energy into building up your dog's microbiome because then you can get what's on sale. 
If broccoli's on sale, great, we do broccoli. If cabbage is on sale, we do cabbage. If it's kale, we do kale, right? And then it gives you more flexibility so that you can save money and still give your dog awesome food um, or awesome toppers, whatever the case may be. Hey, Anastasia, hello. Okay, all right, so that covers all of the questions that we got before the live started. So let me scroll back up here, make sure I didn't miss anything. Hang on. Tugba, Tugba, Demir. Tell me if I'm saying that right. I'm probably not, but that just might be the coolest name ever. I'm pretty sure it's the coolest name ever. Okay, she said you're the best, Allie. No, you're the best. <laughs> Brandy said, thank you, a friend feeds it and the dog keeps diarrhea since she started it. Yes, and that is not the first time that I've heard that um, about from. I have people who message me all the time and they're like, oh, I'm on Purina Pro Plan and my dog constantly gets diarrhea. My dog's on from. What's the other one that causes diarrhea all the time? I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I think it's one of the Royal Canaan varieties. Um, the reason why that is, and please tell your friend, is because they don't have consistency in manufacturing. I'm sure that you guys have all seen the huge lawsuit that took place with Science Diet, where they were killing dogs left and right, and cats too, I think, um, because there was too much vitamin D in the food. It's because the, the manufacturing, they somewhere along the line in the process of making the food, it was getting screwed up. And I find that there are a few companies, like the ones I listed, that consistently have issues. And they have to take it back. And then they have issues and they take it back. And then they change their formula and then they, they have issues and then they take it back. So it's um, that level of inconsistency especially with from because they had inconsistencies all the way back i would say more than more than 10 years ago when i worked for the pet food companies um they they've had inconsistency for a long time so yeah i would i would definitely tell your friend that it would be worth it to them to to make, fix um switch to something else okay tanya says are primal bone marrow bones okay okay so <sighs> marrow bones are one of those things that i don't recommend because people like them because they're long lasting but large marrow bones are almost always weight-bearing bones, which means the bones are very dense. And even when they're raw, there's always that risk that your dog could break a tooth. Also, with, with the longer marrow bones, um, when they're cut down the middle, right, they're kind of like sliced long ways so that all the marrow is exposed, that is a lot of fat. That is a lot of fatty fat fat. And most dogs don't have that level of fatty fat fat in their diet that they get on a regular basis. And so what ends up happening is dogs can have a bout of acute pancreatitis, right? Where it can be just too much on their system. Um, the other thing is those bones have a tendency to be machine cut, right? And this, people are always, let me draw you a picture here. People are always asking me, they're like, oh, well, what do you mean machine cut? So, that picture was terrible. Let me try this again. We're drawing a bone. Here is the end. Okay. Okay. All right, this is better. Okay, so 
when you're looking straight on the bone, right, you can see the bone is here and the marrow is this inner part. Um, as your dog eats away at this, they will chip off pieces of bone in here and also around the corner. Now, when the bone is long, right, it's cut on these ends. And what happens is it creates sharp points like this point up here, which can scrape the dog's gums, right? And not in a good teeth cleaning kind of way. Um, it can cause problems. Again, teeth breakage, um, plus the high fat content, I just don't recommend it. There are so many other fantastic bone options that I just don't think it's necessary. And if you have a moderate to aggressive chewer, forget it. No way. Marrow bones, not a good idea. So, de um, Tanya, definitely take a look at the bones and healthy chews document in the files because I list it out based on the dog's size and I give you some options um, so you can find something that works for your dog. Okay, Anastasia said, what's a good quality wet food for a small breed? So um, ideally, you'd want to do a fresh food if you've got a small breed. Um, if you can't do fresh food and you need to do wet food or canned food, um, I have a list in the recommended food list. When you're kind of going down the list, down at the bottom of the list, it'll say canned. And it'll give you all of the great canned options. So I would definitely rotate through those. But if you can afford to do one of the fresh food options or one of the recipes in the files, then I would definitely um, recommend those over a canned food. Okay, Crystal says, is it okay to feed a chicken recipe in the morning? And then for example, the turkey in the second time that day. Okay, yes, absolutely. Again, you want to make sure that you're building your dog up to that. So maybe what you do is a chicken recipe in the morning. You give them a little bit of the turkey recipe as like a treat or a snack, right? And then you do chicken recipe again for their um, dinner time meal. Then the next day, you give them a little bit more turkey little bit less chicken, a little bit more turkey, a little bit less chicken, right? So you're kind of building them up. Um, some dogs have stomachs of steel and they do fantastic. And you can just swap out one of the meals and replace it with another one and give them, um, you know, a probiotic and they're fine and they don't get diarrhea. It's really going to depend on the dog. So just kind of experiment with it. If you're not sure, err on the side of caution and just slowly build up to that second meal. And then if you wanna add in a third meal where the next day you're doing beef and turkey, then you're gonna, right, same, same process. The idea is that you get your dog to a point where it doesn't matter what you're feeding them. Let's say you had five recipes. It doesn't matter which one you pull for that day they should be able to eat it and be perfectly fine. So you can absolutely do that. Okay, Kathy said, thoughts on feeding ground beef cooked. I love it. It's great. I like to cook ground beef, lay it out, crumble, crumble it, right? Cook it, crumble it, lay it out on a baking sheet, put it in the freezer, pull it out, scrape off, put them into Ziploc bags, and now you've got perfect little treats for the road. Or if you're doing training, it's a phenomenal training treat for puppies, especially when it's hot outside. And then you've got little nuggets of icy cold goodness. So I love the ground beef. Um, if you're feeding uh, an adult who is overweight, or a senior, then you wanna to try to get as lean as possible with your ground beef, right, before you cook it. And then when you cook it, always make sure you're draining off all of that grease, don't put it in your sink. Um, and yeah, you can go from there. But yeah, 
cooked ground beef, great topper for food. It's in a ton of the recipes that are in the files. So if you wanna make your own food, you can absolutely use cooked ground beef. Um, it's great for a training treat. It's great for um, stuffing into Kongs and puzzle toys and yeah, lick mats. You can put your um, your pumpkin puree on there and then sprinkle the ground beef or the frozen ground beef. Really press it in, freeze it again, give it to your dog, right? You can really have a lot of fun um, with cooked meats. So yeah, thank you for that one, Kathy. That was a great question. Do, 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 do. So Judy said a good place to compare dog foods and she's got a website listed here. I'm not familiar with that website. Always, always make sure that if you're comparing dog foods that you're looking to see who runs that site. Because if it's not a canine nutritionist or a veterinary nutritionist, then it could be run by a dog food company. Um, and there are quite a few of them out there who do that. So always be careful. I'm not familiar with that site. I'd have to go take a look at it. Okay. Tanya said, thank you. I have one in my freezer, but I've not given it yet because never given bones before and I was nervous. Absolutely. But listen, those marrow bones, there's no reason to throw it away. Put it in a pot make bone broth. Those marrow bones make phenomenal bone broth. You can scrape out all the yummy goodness. Um, I've got a video on how to make bone broth and that is a phenomenal treat to give your dog. It's great to have on hand. You can freeze it. You can add it to their food, right? So take that marrow bone, make yourself some bone broth, throw it in your crock pot. You'll be all set. She's talking about fake marrow bone made by Purina. Okay, well, I don't recommend anything by Purina. Um, and as far as those bones that are made to look like real bones, no, definitely not those. Um, I have a video where I go through and I look at all of the ingredients in those chews. Um, it's the canine nutrition shop with me, canine nutritionist goes to Target. I have that one. I think it's in the nutrition playlist on my YouTube channel. Definitely take a look at that. Yeah, cause like greenies, milk bones, all of those bone shaped, that none of those are good for your dog's teeth. None of them. They are all contributing to dog cavities. So definitely don't use those. Okay, Kathy said also ground chili meat. Both are a pasture raised Wagyu cow. Okay, well that sounds that's that sounds fancy. That's a fancy cow. <laughs> we have so much and would love to use it if okay. Um so the only thing that's tripping me up is when you say chili meat I'm assuming um, it doesn't have any seasonings, right? It's not spicy, it doesn't have beans, right? We're just talking about a ground meat, right? Let me know, Kathy. But yes, assuming it's just, it might be ground chili meat, might be like a combination of cuts from a cow, right? That could be it. If that's the case, then yes, that's perfectly fine. Um, you just wanna make sure that it's not too high in fat. That's the only thing. Cause sometimes when you're combining different cuts like shoulder and butt and all that, um, the fat content can get a little bit high. So just keep an eye on that. But yeah, absolutely. 
Okay, Anastasia has a great question. What do you think of Fresh Pet? Um, I think that it is a great concept with poor execution. Yeah, Fresh Pet, the refrigerator food. Um, it's a great idea. And I, I did try a number of their products when they first came out because I was very excited for people to have a fresh food option because there really wasn't anything that was readily available. The problem with Fresh Pet is most of their recipes have legumes, potatoes, which I don't recommend. Secondly, and more importantly, they have a huge problem with mold. I mean, you could open a bag and the next day the food could be covered in mold. Or if you got those uh, tubes of food, you go to cut into it and there's mold in the center. So um, for those reasons, I don't recommend Fresh Pet. They're getting crazy out there. But great concept, not good follow through. However, if you're looking for something that's very similar to Fresh Pet, um, the Tylee's pork recipe, phenomenal. Same, it's got the same little pieces. It's got great ingredients. I know it can be kind of hard to get a hold of it right now. I used to order it through Chewy and they were having a distribution problem. I don't know if they fixed that yet. So, um, but yeah, there are a couple of different companies on the recommended food list that do make foods that are uh, very similar to Fresh Pet, but better quality. So if you're looking for that kind of convenience factor, um, a couple of things I would recommend is when you purchase something like the Tylees, if you get a big bag, there's like a two pound bag or like an eight pound bag. If you have a small dog, you can get the eight pound bag, which is more cost effective. Take some of the food out into a Ziploc bag and then put the rest of the food in the freezer. Then you can portion out from your Ziploc bag all throughout the week. Then you can defrost the food for the following week, right? And you're not, you're not running into that risk of the food, um, you know, starting to grow mold or grow bacteria, um, even though it's in the fridge. So always, always, always smell it when you open the bag. If it smells off, then don't feed it. Hey, Allison's here. She said, I made it. I'm still at work, but I couldn't miss the live. Yay! Well, thankfully, because of our awesome, awesome group members, we are going to be having more live sessions. So even if you had missed it, Allison, we, we would be okay because there will be more. You're very welcome, Crystal. Okay, great. Da, da, da. Okay, Kathy said it was just a coarse grind. Yeah, that's totally fine. Totally fine. So, Judy was listing another, um, it's a, looks like an article from Dogs Naturally Magazine, which I like, I'm a huge fan of them. Um, so there's, she's talking about the great salt divider. So for all commercial pet food, salt is kind of like that, that marker that is consistent in all foods. So it's the 1%. So anything that comes after salt, very, very low quantities of those items in the food. And for the most part, you'll see that they are vitamins, minerals, right, that are being added back into the food. Sometimes companies will add in things like cantaloupe and kale and, you know, rhubarb and blueberries, right? But it all comes after salt. So there's very little of those really great ingredients in the actual food. So just something to keep in mind there. Kathy, you are very welcome. 
Okay, Amy's got something. She said, my local grocery store has pig feet, very high in fat, and tails, are they okay to give? Um, the tails would likely be a good option. I would steer clear of pig's feet. Are they fine to give? Yes. Are they super high in fat? Yes. So I don't recommend them. The tails would likely be fine. Um, we have had turkey wings raw. Perfect. Dehydrated chicken and duck feet. Great. Which have been a major hit with my puppy. Those are all excellent options. Amy, if you were here, I would just hug you because I want every puppy owner to do what you're doing right now. You're awesome. Yeah, just just stick with what you're doing. Don't do the pig's feet. You can look at the tails. If they look like they're not super fatty, you could do that as an option. Um, you'd probably have better luck with um, like a cow tail or an ox tail. Again, you're gonna be looking at that fat content. You just wanna be careful with a puppy because when you get those higher fat chews going, you can give your little puppy a little explosive booty and we don't want that to happen. So, but you're doing fantastic. Just keep doing what you're doing. Again, the idea with puppies is that you want to expose them to a lot of different chews. By the way, don't forget about frozen carrots. Those are a great option. Um, you wanna expose them to a lot of different chews, but at the same time, you don't wanna do too much all at one time. So Amy, I don't know how old your puppy is, but you're doing fantastic. Keep up the good work. Okay, great. Okay, Michelle's got a question. When a puppy goes into heat, oh, this will be a good one. How long could their appetite be changed for? Is there more than, is there, is more than a month normal? So, yes and no. I'm gonna have to take a drink for this one. By the way, um, Swedish fish, okay? It's a delicious candy, if you know, you know. Okay, so when your puppy goes into heat, how long can their appetite be changed for? It really depends on the hormones. You could be looking at a week, you could be looking at two weeks. I would say a month is a bit much. Um, when you say a change in appetite, do you mean that your puppy has become picky or your puppy has um, is skipping meals or your puppy um, is eating less? Give, give me some more information to work with. How did their appetite change? Tell me. That way um, I can give you some tailored advice. The reason why I'm asking for more information is, especially if it's your dog's first heat cycle, for the first heat cycle, the hormones kind of go, wee, right? Um, and then for the second heat cycle, they have a tendency to really level out and be smoother. The first heat cycle is always the hardest, always the worst. It's always when they have all of the... Um, crazy symptoms and then the second heat cycle has a tendency to be better so um they can have changes in appetite but if it's for a long period of time like a whole month depending on what those change in changes in appetite are um you may want to consider taking her to the vet and just having them check her hormone level so when a female dog is in heat, basically her body treats the body, her hormones treat like the body as if she's pregnant, even though she's not. The hormones are the same. They kind of go in like this bell curve and then they kind of taper off. So um, it really, 
it really depends on the dog. They will have appetite changes. Sometimes they'll eat less, sometimes they'll eat more, but I, I don't, if it's been more than a month, I don't want to make you think that that's, you know, no big deal because that would not be common. Okay. Maria said, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the answer to the ground beef question. Is it okay or not? Yes, it is. I give my pups cooked ground beef with veg with veggies. Yes, that's fantastic. Good job. Keep up the good work. Amy said she's nine months old and 53 pounds. Okay, great. Yeah. She should be fine to do um, like a pigtail then. She should be okay. All right, Josie says, my dog won't eat raw veggies or frozen. She will only eat if they are cooked. Does that ruin the nutritional value? That is a great question. No, it does not ruin the nutritional value unless you are burning the crap out of them before you give them to your dog. And I'm going to guess that you're not burning the crap out of them before you give them to your dog. So... Yeah, they still have nutritional value. Just like when we cook vegetables for ourselves and eat them, they still have nutritional value. Um, I know that that's one of the common myths out there is that, oh, you know, if, if the food is cooked, then there's no nutritional value. And that's, that's not how nutrition works. So you're doing fine. If your dog prefers them to be cooked, then you have just become her personal chef. <laughs> Welcome to my life. So um, one of the best things you can do is steam the vegetables, right? That's a really good option. Or, um, you know, if you're sauteing them in a pan, whatever's convenient for you, just don't cook them until they're mush, if that makes sense. And certainly don't burn them. And yeah, you'll be fine. Okay. Crystal said, I have a post that hasn't been answered. If it, it's if pups can have turkey tails, turkey tails. I know they can have turkey necks. Yes. Different. We usually give them prime turkey necks. Not sure it's good. Huh? Um, I'm not familiar with turkey tails. So that's a very good question. I would need to look at that. So if you can tag me on your post and link to, if it's primal that you're getting, the, wherever it is you're getting the turkey tails, if you'll link it for me so I can go take a look at it, I'll, I'll take a look for you. Because I'm not sure. See, this is the problem with pet products because turkey neck seems like it would be very straightforward right and then turkey tail it's like mm, you got to be careful because sometimes they'll call things what they're not so yeah just link me in that when you post it and i'll take a look at it for you and make sure that it's okay okay michelle said i think she's being picky she stopped eating her raw she tried two different brands, then would only eat freeze-dried a couple of weeks on that. She stopped eating again. I have an appointment Monday. Yeah, I would just have them check her hormones just to see, you know, did she level back out based on um, when her heat cycle was because it, it lasts for a long time. Like I said, their body acts like it's pregnant even when they're not pregnant. So, um, yeah, just have them check her hormones, check her progesterone, see what level it is. Um, and if you post about it, I can help you, or I'm sure the vet is, um, could help you. Yeah, she might just be being picky, which is okay. Just gotta, gotta roll with the punches sometimes. But usually after about 60 days, they kind of get back to normal after that first heat cycle. Not that they all have issues on the first heat cycle, but it does happen. Okay, Josie said, what's the best dog food for a doodle puppy 
we are looking to change dog food. Well, there are a lot of really great options. Oh, I had two Josies back to back. Okay, Josie K. Um, there are a lot of really great options. Make sure you take a look at the recommended food list. It's in the featured section of the group. Um, for a doodle, depends on what type of doodle it is. Um, for the most part, with puppy food, you're going to be looking at something that's lamb-based. Farmina is a great option. I love the mini and maxi, the blueberry. That's a really good one. All of my dogs love the Farmina, the blueberry. Um, I have also used the Nature's Logic pork, which is an all-life stages food. That's a great option. Not a lot of pork options on the market, so you don't have to worry as much about uh, the dog having an allergic reaction. Um, unfortunately, Nature's Logic is kind of expensive right now, so it's going to depend on um, if you have other dogs and what your budget is. But definitely take a look at uh, the recommended food list because there are a ton of options on there. And anything that says puppy food is obviously puppy food. And if it says ALS, that means all life stages. If it says ALS plus LB, LB is large breed, which again, it depends on what doodle, what version O doodle you have. Maybe a large breed, it may not. So yeah, just check that out. Okay. And Josie S was saying that she steams them a little, so they have a little crunch to them. It's perfect. Yeah, steaming is really great because you're not gonna lose a lot of the nutrients like you would if you were if you were sauteing them. Josie K came back and said, Is there a raw dog food brand? We're also interested in going raw. That would be a phenomenal option for your doodle. And yes, um, you'll see when you look at the recommendation list that there are um, cooked options, there's raw options, there's freeze dried, there's kibble, um, there's canned. All of it is on the list, so just, it's it's a pretty long list, but just kind of scroll down and take a look. And what you can do, um, and what I do for people, is um, you can just kind of copy and paste, like if you're on a computer, you can copy and paste and put the name of the food in on like Chewy.com or on Google, and then you can kind of compare prices. And that can be a really great way to find something. Or if you're looking for something local to you, you can see, you know, which brands are available locally. I always recommend supporting a small, um, a small pet food store if you can, if you have one local to you. Okay, great. We got, we got the instance of double names all over again. So we had two Josies. Now we've got two Judys back to back. So Judy Gray is asking about dental care. So you'll have to be a little more specific in your question. Are you asking about taking your dogs to the vet for dental care? Are you asking about brushing their teeth? Which is always a good option. Um, I am a huge advocate for raw meaty bones, right, for dental care, so that's a good option. So let me know what, you, what your question is about dental care so I can help you out. And then Judy B says, if you're feeding gently cooked, can you introduce raw chicken feet? Yes. And other raw meaty bones without a transition since none of the other foods are raw? Yes. So, um, for a very long time, I did, um, gently cooked one of the recipes in the files and then did chicken feet for Bear. He's our, um, senior Pomeranian. And then the larger dogs, the poodles, they got turkey necks, chicken necks. Um, so yeah, absolutely you can. You don't necessarily have to have the whole meal be raw in order to add in a raw bone, or 
you don't necessarily have to feed them together at the same time. It just depends on um, the recipe that you're using and um, depends on your dog, of course. So this kind of goes back to um, my rotation video, which I highly recommend, and building up that microbiome so that if you want to introduce something like raw chicken feet or another raw bone, right, your dog is well equipped um, to give that a try. That's the puppy. It's Indy and Bear. They're playing right outside the door. Okay, Crystal said she's going to tag me. You're very welcome, Josie. Okay, so I'm going to take this as a sign that it's time for me to go. <laughs> um, I was very busy with work today, so the dogs did not to get out. They didn't get to go outside and run around like they normally do. So I am going to jump off of here. Thank you guys so much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate it. Definitely make sure you go check out those documents in the file that I was talking about in the file section of the group. Also, if you joined us late, no worries. I'll be keeping this recording and then posting it to um, my YouTube channel. So make sure you're subscribed there so that um, if you ever miss a live video, you can always watch the replay. And if you would like to donate, I do have a link in the uh, in the Facebook group, and then I'll also put it down in my YouTube channel description. Um, all of the donations go toward us having live sessions like this, where people can have their questions answered for free, and we can all do the best that we possibly can for our pets, because that's why we're here. And that's what's important. So everybody go and hug your dog for me. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And we'll see you in the next live session, which is likely going to be early next week. So be kind. Rewind. <laughs>